I'm intrigued by the really kind of uh, tough B2B um, business idea with some of that you've built and, and um, others kind of going into industries and, and identifying very specific areas. Um, is that a good business to you or what, what's your idea of a good business? I mean, are you seeing good businesses, other good businesses in Northeast Ohio now that, you, that intrigue you? Um, so I'll take it from the B2B perspective. I mean, we, we, we were a B2B company. Um, selling a, a, a subsystem, a component into some other device which in turn sold to some business for logistics or healthcare or what have you. Um, and I, I think the likelihood of success in a B2B scenario is probably greater than a B2C business to consumer scenario. On the other hand, with B2B, it's the, the, the industry is only going to be so large, the niche is only going to be so large, and so you're going to have a, a finite number of customers, and you're going to be basically enslaved to them. I mean, you, you You've got a reputation to build and protect, and if you screw it up, it's, it's, it's fatal. Conversely, with a B2C thing, you know, if, you, if you've got a few customers that are not terribly happy with you, they can make your life miserable, but they're not necessarily fatal. Of course, with social media today, that makes it not quite as much the case as it would have been a few years ago. Um, so I like B2B because I know it, yeah. but at the same time, I'm envious of people that are in B2, B2C companies where you can say, yeah, you know what, screw you, dude move on to the next yeah. next customer. As far as, as Northeastern Ohio goes, you know, it's 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 where you're located, it's where your 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 place is where your employees are, but as far as your customers go, you know, our largest customers in Bologna, Italy, most of our, the great majority of our revenues come from Asia. And with the way things are today, you really don't think in terms of your business being in Northeastern Ohio, you think your business is being your business it just happens to be located here, but you really gotta be thinking in terms of you know, where are all the sources of revenue? Where are all the customers? And more often than not, they're they're, they're everywhere. Uh, Flappy Birds, you know, the guy didn't think yeah, of business yeah. being in Vietnam. I mean, he, yeah. he was in Vietnam. It was, it was the world. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Question from uh, Blaine Blaine Sheesley. What are your thoughts on crowdfunding by Kickstarter? Would you ever take advantage of it? So, thanks, Blaine. Blaine works with me at Clary. Um, <laughs> Kickstarter is is classic B to C. I mean, you you've got to have prototype or ideally at least a prototype pilot production. Um, the way it works today is you, at least at this moment, you can't go out and solicit funding to do more of a B2B sort of thing. So I think I think it's amazing. Um, I think it's a great way to start things. I think it's I think it's much better to be able to start a business consumer company in that fashion by testing the waters and getting real customers than having to go hat in hand to some VC guy or some so-called angel investor and beg them for money and take a bunch of equity. I think it's a much more democratic, a much more fair way for entrepreneurs. And I would hope that over time that whole thing evolves where it's not just a B2C means of doing a startup, but evolves also to include, uh, include B2B. Got okay, a question from Jake E. Tobin. How different is project management now uh, versus your time in Cisco, and maybe what, what, uh, how does business culture differ too? So, so you had touched on, 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 on agile and minimally viable product and all that, and I should confess that six months ago I had no idea what agile development and agile programming meant. But for me, it's really been sort of a revelation. And what it does is it embraces the idea that when you're starting a project up, you don't really know how it's going to end. You don't know when it's going to end. Um, when someone, when you start a project up and you've got some suits, some finance guys say, well, you know, how many man months, person months is this going to take? And what are the investments and when exactly are you going to guarantee me that we're going to be shipping? The real answer is, dude, I have no idea. I don't know. It's some period of time. We'll see how it all works out. That doesn't go over really well. With Agile, though, it embraces it. It's, it's look, I mean, we're, we understand vaguely what we want to do, we understand the resources at some level that we're going to need, we understand the various user stories, use cases for this whole thing, and as we move through this process, as we go on this journey, we'll better refine what the product's going to be, we'll better refine what, what the schedule's going to be. What it means then is that companies have to, and inclusive of the suits, have to embrace uncertainty and still embark on things, which means there's a greater degree of trust re uh, required from the commercial side and the and, and the um, and the technical side, Agile embraces the idea of uncertainty, embraces the idea of learning as you move through the process, and it really takes the notion of a Gantt chart and a waterfall and just throws it away. And I think that ultimately, that, that's a good thing. Awesome.
Okay, I got a question from Redbeard. R. Uh, R. When, 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 what do you, sorry. Where do you see Laird going in five years? Well, so, I mentioned before the company's 140 years old, and they're trying now to transform themselves from being a largely manufacturing company and a components company into more of a systems company that incorporates hardware and software, software on both the client side and the server side, and all the services and support that goes around that. So, you know, apparently I'm an executive in the company, so I'm supposed to say that five years from now, I see that being a successful process, and, and I, I, I believe it. There's a lot of people now that they're bringing in that um, are, are pursuing that, and, and they're and they're spending real money, and, you know, millions, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars on, on acquiring the kind of companies and pieces they need to build that sort of that sort of organization. That's awesome that it's here as well, right? Yeah. That the, 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 the what was once Summit is now a division of a huge company in Africa. Well, it was it was really cool. I mean, I my partners and I, many of us, all of us were. All the one were from Northeastern Ohio originally, and a lot of us left town. Um, I went to California, lived out there for a total of ten years, and I came back. And so when Laird said, you know, we want to, we want to buy you, we want to give you millions of dollars, and we also want to like leave this here in Akron and then build upon that. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that because, you know, like like I think quite all of us here. I mean. We choose to live in Northeastern Ohio either because that's where we're from, or, or we came here, and we're all passionate about technology. And you know, the degree to which all of us can play some small role in helping to make this into the tech hub that it, that it can be—that's pretty cool. And, and Laird, that was part of—that was definitely part of the attraction of of, of, of Laird. Awesome. And and the money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm judging by my beer that we're all due for another one, so I'm going to ask another two questions. Um, what is your biggest bargaining chip to attract top talent? <laughs> you know, it, it, my, my coworkers may disagree with me on that, but you know, Jesus, just try to try to put together a decent place to work. I mean, you know, we've we've all got so much bullshit we have to deal with, and we've all got so much going on. And then if if, if the place where you work makes you conform to a bunch of ridiculousness, like you know, clocking in and clocking out and keeping your hours, and you know, sorry, you were here at 9:35 and it was nine o'clock. I know your kids are sick, but well, suck it up. You need to, have to be in the office today. You know, it's just. It's it's about the work. It's about the um, it's about the, the production. It's not necessarily about the hours or the location. Yeah, it's great to have people all in one place, but you have to have that degree of flexibility. And, and the thing that I think you really really have to keep in mind in technology is that the the assets, the human assets that we all need to be successful, they're human beings, and they are they are a very dear commodity. As Eric was talking about, there's a huge shortage of of developers, and if you try to impose some sort of you know corporate nonsense horribleness on them, they're going to walk away and you're not going to be successful. So it, it's, it's the compensation, sure, absolutely, but that's really just sort of table stakes. Beyond that, I mean, if I worked at Cisco. They paid a really good buck. It was a horrible job. I walked away from it. And I think that's true of anyone else that's in a position where they can go and take their, take their, skills, their skills elsewhere. Awesome. Okay, the last question I do not understand, so I'm just going to read it for Vayner here. What impact does iBeacon have on the wireless logistics market segment? <laughs> That's got to be one of my coworkers. That was from Fred Neal. <laughs> um, yeah. So iBeacons. Uh, iBeacons are using a technology called Bluetooth Low Energy, which you find in all your iPhones, increasingly in, in Android phones. And it's the idea now of being able to have little tags that are going to cost something on the order of 10 bucks, run a coin cell battery for on the order of two, three, four years. And they will tell your smartphone where you're located. Your smartphone can tell. So what it comes down to is that you will have context awareness, location awareness, by virtue of carrying this, this, this very powerful computer in your pocket, your smartphone with you, and having beacons everywhere. So, you, so you're going to know where you're at. You'll have information about where you're at. And in some scenarios, those who need to know where you're at will be able to find you in uh, hospital scenarios, as, as one example. So Bluetooth. Bluetooth Low Energy, I think, is a technology that really enables the, the Internet of Things, which is moving from being just, you know, a hype and a bunch of words into being something truly real. And, and in our company at uh, Laird, we're playing a small role in it. I think it's one of the most exciting things that's going on. 
Wi-Fi was a, a was a huge, huge change. Bluetooth, kind of. Bluetooth Low Energy, I think, is on the order of magnitude of Wi-Fi in terms of really changing how things are things are done. We can only imagine the applications for it today. It's really cool. That's awesome. I didn't understand the question, but I really enjoyed the answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, everybody, run side to me. Um, yeah, okay, thank you very much, guys. Uh, now, it's a rare moment that we all get together to drink, so please stay here until late. The bar is open, have fun. Everybody, and actually, just one big thing. I want to thank the Tech Pint team, all the guys in the, the green shirts. Can you give them all a round of applause, please? And anybody who I have asked a clear question, see Tracy, she has a t-shirt for you too. Alright, okay, thanks everybody.